Why should we be talking about allergies? Huh? That's one of the questions I uh, usually do when I first uh, have a lecture with my students. Why? Why? Because it is very common nowadays, one in three children. Thank you very much. And by 2025, the European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology says that it will be one in two. So think it about as a speciality. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. So this lecture, what it will be about? We're going to talk about the allergy epidemic. That's the increase in allergic disease uh, over the last years. Uh, we'll try to see why allergy is increasing, possible risk and prevention factors, and uh, hypothesis formed. Uh, I'm going to focus mainly on prevention strategies that have uh, made uh, nutritional interventions, uh, maternal diet and breastfeeding. Uh, and I will focus mainly on hydrolyzed uh, milk formulas and the allergy reduction trial that was uh, uh, part of our uh, work lately. The timing of introduction of allergenic solids that is very popular uh, in uh, the recent uh, years. Uh, then we'll go with the clinical scenario that I think it's important and how we translate the research into clinical practice. And uh, then we'll have our uh, conclusions. So, why should we be talking about allergy? Already mentioned, one in two in the following years. And we refer to as it epidemic. We have a dramatic increase from 1960s to 2000 in respiratory allergies, asthma, hay fever. And the last two decades, three decades, we have dramatic increase in atopic dermatitis eczema and food allergy and anaphylaxis. One in three kids in our days is affected by at least one allergy. There are some kids that will be with more than one allergy. Most of these conditions are unfortunately chronic and some may be life-threatening as a severe asthma attack or anaphylaxis. The diagnosis is challenging, it's not always straightforward and a permanent cure is lacking for many of these diseases. Therefore, the quality of life of these children and their families is significantly impaired. Furthermore, the costs on healthcare systems are increasing. And what do we need? We urgently need effective preventive strategies to try and halt this allergy epidemic. These are data from different parts of the world regarding the uh, rate of food induced anaphylaxis uh, admissions in hospitals. Huh? Australia, United States, UK, Italy. So what do we have? Dramatic increase. Which are the main foods that are associated with these anaphylactic reactions? Nuts, milk, egg, seafood, fish, and vegetables account for the majority of reactions. And definitely none of us in this room want to face this in his medical career, okay? dramatic situation. So, could we prevent that? We wish we could. Let's start where from? From the atopic march. What is the atopic march? Is the term that has been coined to describe the progression of early life allergies like atopic dermatitis, eczema and foot allergy to other allergies later in life. Asthma, hay fever, allergic rhinitis, anaphylaxis. So through our lifespan, we may develop an allergy at any time point. And the two first that usually show up is either atopic dermatitis or eczema. And what comes first? Huh? Is it atopic dermatitis or is it foot allergy? It would be good to find out. A lot of researchers and scientists across the globe had tried to rule it out. And there are some very interesting uh, hypotheses. And uh, my friend Helen Brown in uh, London uh, has uh, published this paper two years ago, uh, trying to show possible causal associations between genetic factors, skin exposures, and diet leading to eczema and food allergy uh, early in life. And what does it involve? Adonis, genes first of all. Hmm? It may be in our genes, 
but our genes have not changed dramatically over the last few decades. So it's perhaps the environment, our diet, or other things that have triggered this increase in allergy. So we may have the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. Anybody, any idea about the dual allergen exposure hypothesis? So this hypothesis, when you have uh, a baby with dry inflamed skin, if he is exposed early to foods through the GI tract, he develops tolerance. If you are delayed to introduce these foods and he has exposure to the proteins from these foods by the inflamed skin, he develops eczema and therefore food allergy later on. So that's only one hypothesis. We have other hypotheses like the hygiene hypothesis. Hmm? You know, I'm uh, sure you're all familiar with the hygiene uh, hypothesis. We're too clean, too high hygienic conditions that does not allow our immune system to mature properly and divert it towards a Th2 pathway, as we tend to say, and prone to allergies. So by understanding the underlying complex mechanisms and associations, by identifying the possible risk and protective factors and formulating hypotheses and trying to uh, confirm this hypothesis, could employ us with effective prevention strategies at different levels. What are the levels? We talk about primary prevention and it's at the stage where our patient, our individual, has not yet been immunologically sensitized. And this is where we should mainly focus, the primary prevention, okay? Uh, you also have secondary prevention when the patient has developed the disease, we don't want it to progress, and tertiary prevention where we uh, should treat the disease. We prefer not to come to this stage. And as we usually say, just get the green light. Huh? Primary prevention. So I would prefer this patient which is at high risk, has an atopic predisposition, his parents or his siblings have asthma or other allergies, to prevent him from developing allergy because his chance of developing allergy is extremely high. And I don't want him to end up with anaphylaxis in hospital or with an asthma attack. So we should focus on primary prevention. Could we prevent the atopic match and the development of allergies with early nutritional interventions? Hmm. There is some optimism with that with different uh, such nutritional interventions and the ongoing good quality research studies will shed some light. Let's have a look. Uh, this uh, is uh, an example of strategies for the prevention of uh, cow's milk protein allergy. It's a result of a meeting we had just before the COVID uh, pandemic uh, with colleagues uh, from uh, different parts of the world in Dubai in 1991, uh, Professor John Warner from the UK. And the first author here is my friend Benjamin Zapeta Ortega from Mexico. So uh, we are gathered there to see if we can find uh, ways that we all realize that cow's milk allergy is increasing in trends. Can we do something to prevent it? And Ig allergy to milk is the one that is immediate, within a few minutes, you are exposed to milk, develop a rash or swelling, you may end up with uh, difficulty in breathing or anaphylaxis. And we have the other type, the delayed type one, the non-ING one, where mainly the symptoms are from the GI tract. And so regarding primary prevention, what are the suggestions there? Can we give a partially hydrolyzed milk to help that? Can we help with early introduction of milk or other foods? Uh, what about supplements like pre-probiotics? Huh? What about vaginal delivery? Huh? Why in that? Why in that? Why about vaginal uh, delivery and not cesarean section? Any idea? Well, what will that help us? Yes, this from Exposure to the microbiome of the mother through that may shape the microbiome of the uh, baby and uh, train it much properly than by cesarean section where we, we do not have exposure. It's within the co uh, uh, context of the hygiene hypothesis. And do you know what is the rate of cesarean sections in Cyprus? Unfortunately, extremely high. Huh? Two out of three pregnant women give birth Whereas the World Allergy Organization suggests that maximum should be up to one in three. 
not Cyprus. Okay, not Cyprus. The study that we did, and I'll show you, Greece, Bulgaria behave the same. So what is the literature saying now, and what are the guidelines suggesting regarding maternal, maternal diet and allergy prevention? These are the latest guidelines from the German uh, uh, Allergy Prevention Guideline 2022. There is no benefit from restricting common allergenic foods such as nuts, egg and fish from maternal diet during pregnancy or lactation. Supplements such as pre-probiotic symbiotics, vitamin D and other vitamins, uh, omega-3, LC, PUFAS, uh, are not recommended for the prevention of allergies and most international guidelines uh, um, just agree on that. The American Academy of Pediatrics also uh, shares the same view. There is limited evidence to support any interventions on maternal diets to prevent atopic disease at the moment. So what do we advise our pregnant uh, patients and mothers? Just have a healthy Mediterranean style uh, diet. Do not make any changes. Be a bit careful with antibiotics. Don't take them if not necessary. What about breastfeeding? Does breastfeeding prevent from allergic disease? Does it? There are a lot of studies saying yes. Many studies showing the other way around. Mm -hmm. So data on this issue are inconsistent as breastfeeding cannot be studied in randomized trials. We cannot say to somebody you will not breastfeed. Therefore, we should all encourage and support breastfeeding for its several other benefits. For allergy, would not necessarily know. And I will show you data later on, local data showing the opposite. Let's move on to partially hydrolyzed formulas. Huh? I know this, but you like this topic. You worked on it. So, what do we mean by partially hydrolyzed formulas? The standard formulas share the intact proteins of whey or casein. Huh? Imagine this is the uh, protein. By breaking down the protein to smaller bits, the peptides, and to weight, molecular weight between 3 and 10 kilodalton, we talk about the partially hydrolyzed formulas. And when we break it further down, hmm, we talk about extensively hydrolyzed infant formulas. As we break it down, we reduce the allergenicity of the protein. Hmm? But there are different, different methods of hydrolysis and degrees of hydrolysis, and therefore uh, the peptides that derive are different, and so on. Their allergenicity and their ability to reduce tolerance is different. And as Professor Muraro from the, the ICI meeting 2019 uh, pointed out, they are not all the same. Hmm? So could they be used for allergy prevention? Could all of them be used for allergy prevention? Let's have a look. The first study that strongly supported hmm, this idea was the GINI study, the German Nutritional Intervention Study uh, of more than 2002. Uh, 152 high-risk infants, hmm? that means their parents or their siblings had allergies. Hmm? And it was independent government sponsored from the late 1990s huh? that they followed children progressively, prospectively, hmm? and they, uh, these infants took either an inked cow milk formula, a partially hydrolyzed milk formula in red, and extensively hydrolyzed casein formula in blue. What did the results show? The results strongly supported the recommendation to use certain hydrolyzed formulas, like the partially hydrolyzed one and the extensively hydrolyzed one, for the prevention of allergies. But then along came Polly, my friend, our research dean, Despo uh, Diagono. Not now, not yet. She's coming. So in 2014, the European Academy of Allergy guidelines were recommending that if breastfeeding is not sufficient uh, and uh, moms need a formula, they should prefer a 
partially hydrolyzed milk formula or an extensively hydrolyzed milk formula that is known to be hypoallergenic hmm, in high-risk infants. So it was 2016 that Tespo came there huh, with my friend Rob Boyle from study in the UK. They did a systemic review and meta-analysis. And what did they conclude? There is no consistent evidence to support the use of hydrolyzed formula for the prevention of allergic or autoimmune disease. So they are questioning the preventive role of partially hydrolyzed formula. Why? There may be a lot of bias, assessment, selection, attrition bias, huh? conflict of interest. These studies are mainly supported and sponsored by milk formula manufacturers. Who is going to uh, sponsor it otherwise? Huh? Should the guidelines, the recommendations be revised? Other people had a different opinion. 2017 uh, such as Ken Hobart in this uh, updated meta-analysis, looking onto a single specific partially hydrolyzed formula, say that there is evidence to consider the use of partially hydrolyzed formula for reducing the risk of any allergic disease, particularly eczema, and that my friend Despo and Bob should not mix apples and oranges together in one box, and that the efficacy and safety of each individual partially hydrolyzed form should be established for each one independently. And that was the European Food Safety Authority regulation in 2016-17. 2018, Cochrane Systemic Review, huh? again agrees with uh, the notion that they are not helpful and that they should not routinely be uh, advised uh, for uh, infants and prevention of allergic disease in preference to breast milk. And guidelines start to change. Huh? That's what we do in medicine, forth and back, huh? usually. That's what we see in later years. So, first of all, the Australian Society that said that uh, they uh, are no longer recommended for the prevention of allergic disease. The Americans agree that there is no evidence. The European Academy now, known to be politics, hmm? good politicians, there is no recommendation for or against using partially or extensively hydrolyzed formulas. So what do they remind us? Jesus from Nazareth, the film, eh? Pontius Pilatus. And when exclusive breastfeeding is not possible, there are many substitutes on the shelves uh, for families to choose from, including hydrolyzed formulas. Are we doctors? Well, we have shared decision making. But is that a good suggestion? I'll leave it to you. The Germans are more precise, I would say, and they say for children with an increased risk of atopic disease, it should be checked whether an infant formula with proven effectiveness demonstrated in allergy prevention studies is available until complementary food is introduced. So look for it. If there's one that is good, go for it. Is it a mission impossible for partially hydrolyzed uh, milk? We need good quality data. That's what we need. And uh, in 2016, uh, my friend Professor Yanis Magnos from Harokopio University in Athens came to Cyprus and said, Nick, we need to design a study to see whether partially hydrolyzed milk formula, a specific one, hmm, could prevent allergic disease. So I was very enthusiastic at the moment, and I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we're going to do this. We're going to look microbioma. We're going to draw blood, blah, 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 blah. Sit, sit back, relax. Huh? Number one, we don't have the money. Second, it will be difficult to gain ethics. So, again, studies are becoming more difficult in our days. Hmm? But at the end, we managed to design a study enrolling 650 kids, high-risk infants, family history of asthma or other allergic diseases in parents or siblings in Bulgaria, Cyprus, and Greece between 2017-2019 with the aim 
to investigate the potential role of this specific partially whey-based formula, which is Frisolac Gold Preventive AHA, compared to a standard formula, which was Frisolac Gold, in reducing the incidence of milk-related allergic manifestations and atopic dermatitis in non-exclusively breastfed infants at high risk for allergy uh, within the first six months of life. And I insisted on uh, taking in parallel a group of exclusively breastfed infants. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think, very, very important. So what did we do? Non-exclusively breastfed infants, those were mothers that uh, couldn't breastfeed exclusively, were randomly allocated to either the partially hydrolyzed formula or the standard formula, by computer-generated tables with stratification for gender and presence of atopic dermatitis in family. We followed a bit uh, the idea of Gini here. The subjects were followed prospectively every two months at the age of two, four, and six months with a clinical assessment by a pediatrician in case of Cybers by uh, myself, a pediatric allergist, and uh, Michaela, who is sitting here to, uh, with us today. She's uh, pediatric uh, nutritionist uh, in our team. She's currently doing her PhD uh, on the follow-up of the study. And how did we define our allergy outcomes? Cow's milk protein allergy was confirmed by food challenge, the gold standard of diagnosing food allergy. Adobic dermatitis by clinical diagnosis combined with the uh, SCORAT, SCORE and COMIS tools that uh, give you uh, um, an idea how severe the atopic dermatitis is. Most important of all, hmm, to avoid any bias, statistical analysis was performed by an independent third party. So when we locked the data, we had nothing to do with the analysis as researchers. Hmm? And we looked into the intention to treat group, which is mean every child that was randomized, and to the per protocol analysis, which is the group that completed the study. Okay? Ah, we also uh, measured weight and height to see if, uh, as a secondary outcome, if uh, uh, these uh, kids had any effect on their growth. That's Michaela uh, doing measurements. This is the flow diagram of our study. As I said, 650 kids in these three countries. 220, quite a large group, was exclusively breastfed and blindly randomized, so it was white boxes. Neither the parents, neither the researchers knew that they were taking either the pH the partially hydrolyzed formula or the standard formula. Hmm? And we managed to allocate 160 in the partially hydrolyzed group and 171 in uh, the uh, standard intact formula group. And we come to the results, which I believe that you'll find interesting. What did we see? This is mixed fed infants. Huh? That means they are breastfeeding and taking a standard formula in red or a partially hydrolyzed formula. And this is the incidence of atopic dermatitis eczema. Significantly lower hmm, in the partially hydrolyzed group. When we looked into the group of kids with a family history from all allergies of atopic dermatitis, this was even more pronounced. Huh? It was also more, but not statistically significantly, in those with no atopic uh, dermatitis family history. So what did we have here? We have a 76 risk reduction in the incidence of atopic dermatitis in these mixed fed subjects. So if we can target this population, uh, we may reduce the risk of developing atopic dermatitis and perhaps other allergies in the future. And what's the number to treat? Very good number, five. That means we need five kids to give this intervention to have success in one. Do you know what the LIP study was the number of needed to treat? We'll come later on. Have that in mind. 
very important. Our intention to treat analysis was almost identical with the per-protocol analysis that you don't easily see in such randomized studies. Huh? That strengthens our results. What about cow's milk protein allergy? It's less in the partially hydrolyzed group, but not significant. Hmm? You see it. However, we are clinicians mainly. Eh? What do you think about clinical significance? If I had more patients, hmm? if I had the chance to recruit more, more likely I would be able to show it. But it's a 0 0.0, 0 0.8. Is it close? It's a trend. And I don't want to provoke you. What's this here? This comes in the breastfeeding group. Does it does breastfeeding prevents from allergy compared to partially hydrolyzed or the combination with the standard formula? I don't think so here with our data. However, as I said, breastfeeding is very important for other reasons. And we move on to the next topic that is very interesting in our days. Does the timing of introduction of solids and allergenic foods prevent the development of allergy? I'm going to take the, the history here eh? of timing of introduction of solids and potentially allergenic foods, again, milk, egg, peanut, and other nuts. And I'll go through international recommendations, American Academy, European Academy, British Society of Allergy, European Society of uh, um, Gastroenterology, etc. What did we tend to say back in 2020? Introduction of solids after the age of six months, delay allergenic foods in high-risk infants. And that's what because they realized that in the early, uh, uh, what do you say, 90s, the food allergies had increased. So in a way, to try and reduce and halt this increase, let's delay them. Cow's milk after the first year, egg after the second, and nuts and fish after the third year. Was that effective? No. So they came back in 2008 and they suggested introduce solids between fourth and sixth month for all infants and no need for delay of all allergenic foods. 2015 Hallmark study that we'll talk about in a bit, the LIP study had changed things. And the suggestion is to early introduction, especially of peanuts in high risk infants in countries with a high prevalence of peanut allergy. And this is the very important LIP study. What did it show? Hmm? It showed that in kids with eczema hmm, or egg allergy, if you introduce early, huh, early peanuts between the fourth and 11 month, compared to those that you advise avoidance, you reduce the prevalence of uh, peanut allergy. And it was a relative reduction uh, of 86 percent, 81 percent in all subjects. This is a skin prick test negative cohort, the skin prick test positive cohort, and both cohorts. So very significant finding that changed our way of managing uh, allergies. I told you to remember the number needed for treatment. What's the number here? One in seven. They have a publication in New England. Ours was one in five. The eight study was in the general population kids, again in the UK, again in New England Journal of uh, Medicine publication, uh, that were trying to introduce early into babies uh, allergenic foods that showed no significant reduction in the prevalence of food allergies in infants with early introduction of the general population. However, there are a lot of uh, dropouts in this study. A lot of dropouts, and I, 
I'm concerned about the firm conclusions of this study. Are the conclusions of the LIPA and its studies applicable to every population? Hmm? What happens in Singapore? Despite huh, the late introduction of foods, there's a low food allergy prevalence. And especially for peanuts. Selfish and eggs, even in high-risk kids with eczema, the prevalence is low. What happened in Cyprus? My PhD thesis is on peanut allergy. And I used to see one in, uh, to five kids a day in the UK with peanut allergy. I moved to Cyprus 15 years ago. I used to see one to five a year. After the guidelines changed, and my colleagues, pediatricians in Cyprus, started, and they were very fun of introducing peanuts in babies' diets early, I observed an increase in the referrals to my clinic with peanutology. Why is that? Cypriots were not. What? They were not introducing early peanuts in their diets previous years. Hmm? So in countries like Cyprus, we may achieve the opposite, increase the prevalence rather than reduce the prevalence. So we should be very careful with infant feeding recommendations and should be tailored to individual populations based on our local data. What is the evidence and the recommendations in general for uh, the introduction of solids, potential allergenic foods. Definitely there is no reason for delayed introduction. On the other hand, there is no reason for very early introduction before the age of four months. So try to introduce them, that's what we advise uh, mothers, uh, at the age of uh, four to six months when solids are introduced in diets. And especially introduce peanut uh, earlier in those countries with a high prevalence of peanut allergy. Introduce also well-cooked early. Hmm? But be careful with kids have an eczema or food allergy that they may have a risk for uh, a severe allergic reaction. So perhaps these kids, it's more important to refer them for testing to a specialist center. It's important to consider local diet culture and family preferences before advising. And definitely further studies are needed to draw firm conclusions and I come to my clinical scenario. Hmm? Imagine that you're sitting in clinic and you have this desperate pregnant mom hmm? of a child with atopic, severe atopic dermatitis hmm? or eczema, asking if she can do something to prevent her new baby from having this disease. As she also suffers from rhinitis in spring and her husband has atopic dermatitis. Can I do something for this mom? Hmm? She definitely will go through Google searches. Huh? She will talk to neighbors, to friends, to other moms huh? in uh, social groups. And she will come to us with perhaps made up her mind. So what should we advise? According to this uh, Malaysian allergy prevention map, which is followed by many countries. This is the risk of developing allergies depending on your family history of allergy. Huh? So if none of your parents has allergy, you still have a 10-20%. If one of your parents, you have a 20 to 40%. Hmm? If they are both with an allergy, the risk increases to 50-80%. So what can I say? to this mom that not only she herself and her husband have allergies, but also her other baby. Huh? Family history is the most important and prevention strategies are commonly applied in high-risk infants, which is a very high-risk infant. So according to this, what can I say? Thank you. We're sorry, I can do nothing for you because of your genes. Hmm? Is it a good answer? I can go back and think about protective or risk factors. Huh? We talked about um, 
uh, cesarean section, we used about we talk about diet, uh, early infections, pets. Uh, the new trend now in the state is to adopt a dog. Uh, and it was found in many many studies that it may uh, shape the microbiome uh, towards a preventive effect. What shall I advise? Uh, don't take antibiotics. Stop smoking. Ask your uh, obstetrician uh, to uh, avoid C-section. You've seen the high rate in Cyprus. Hmm? But it's not only doctors, it's moms now that she would prefer, for example, to have the day of her uh, birth uh, for her child, 22nd of the second or 22. Huh? What to advise based on our data? Can you advise anything to this mom based on our data? Yes, I can. And I'm very confident with our data to suggest that if she cannot breastfeed exclusively, and we said we encourage breastfeeding, try this specific whey-based partially hydrolyzed formula. And there's a risk, one in five chance to reduce it. Can we prevent, though, the atopic match? Huh? We reduce the possibility of developing eczema, but can we do that? At preventing asthma, hay fever, food allergy and anaphylaxis. Well, I've already mentioned that our study is ongoing. Michaela, through her PhD, is doing now the five-year follow-up. I hope we'll have some answers soon. Hmm? Soon, in the following two years, we'll be able to give an idea, yes or no. Or what can we do? Return to nature. That's what the Finnish has done. Huh? Finland making the allergy and asthma epidemic in 2020. It's lessons from the Finnish experience. Nature, step to allergy health. Back to nature. Hmm? So, dirt that Americans tend to say, go back to nature. A good fresh fruits, berries and vegetables diet, Mediterranean diet. Uh, try to reduce pollution. Give birth by vaginal delivery, breastfeed, no use of antibiotics, microbial supplementation, animal contacts, outdoor activities, all that will have an effect on our immune system and give a balance and perhaps prevent allergies. And to conclude, I feel that if we understand the causes and underlying mechanisms of the increase in allergy that will help us to employ prevention strategies to hold the allergy epidemic. Is allergy prevention possible? I believe yes. But we need to use nutritional and other interventions on different levels by considering local risk and protective factors and assessing the efficacy of such potential strategies by wholly high quality clinical trials. Then we could make evidence-based recommendations. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I believe that preventing is better than treating. And uh, at this point I would like to thank all my colleagues uh, from the uh, multi-international uh, uh, art study team. Uh, here is Michaela. Uh, all the pediatricians and neonatologists, obstetricians, midwives and nurses, parents and children of the art study. There were 190 kids enrolled in, uh, babies enrolled in Cyprus. So imagine how many people helped uh, and I'm very grateful to them uh, to uh, recruit all these uh, subjects. Uh, of course to Frizzle and Campina that uh, sponsored this study and to the university of Nicosia Medical School for uh, giving me the chance to join when I came back to the UK. Thank you all and I hope you enjoyed the lecture.